Hello and welcome to another episode of the Civil Line Insight Podcast. My name is Cindy Stewart. I am the lead America's analyst at Civil Line. And today I am joined by Alex Marciniak, our associate analyst for Latin America. Pleasure to be here, Cindy. Thank you. So, Alex, um, since early September, we have seen an outpouring of violence in Culiacán and Sinaloa in Mexico. Um, Can you give us just a bit of a primer on what's been going on in recent weeks? Sure. So since the 9th of September, around 118 people have died in Sinaloa and the majority in Culiacán, the state capital. And this is a mere ongoing feud between two factions within the Sinaloa cartel. Uh, This all kicked off as a result of two arrests that the U.S. authorities made on the 25th of July. So the U.S. authorities arrested a leader of the Chapitos faction and the La Maisa faction of the Sinaloa cartel. And it's been a two-month sort of quiet period where the two factions have been arming themselves ahead of the outbreak of violence in early September, where we've seen these deaths, blockades and uh, disappearances. So, Alex, given that we have seen at least uh, 118 people so far killed since the uh, violence broke out on the 9th of September... Um, what are we likely to see in the short term? So in the short term, it will likely be sustained. And there's a realistic possibility that we'll see spillover into neighboring states. So the key areas we're looking at for violence are Culiacan, but principally the highways. So the Federal Highway 15, Federal Highway 15D, and the uh, Mazatlan-Durango Highway as well, which leads from Mazatlan, a city in South Sinaloa, into Durango, one of the neighboring states. So this will likely persist in the coming weeks, but the violence affects the cartel's bottom line. So the personnel they're employing to carry out these attacks and this violence are likely drafted in from their normal drug trafficking operations. So the operational efficiency of their drug trafficking, drug production is likely being hit. And this will likely weaken them in the longer term and force them to return to usual operations therefore moderating the violence in the longer term. But a resolution to the conflict between the two of these factions seems unlikely. So we'll likely see continued outbreaks of escalation in the longer term, but not a sustained conflict in the next few months. Okay, so to break the situation down a little bit more, um, what we're seeing in Culiacan is um, an outbreak of violence. And and these highways that you mentioned are kind of key junctures, um, given that they act as boundaries for each of the respective factions. Yeah, that's right. So we're likely to see um, continued supply chain disruption and operational risks in these areas. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. But also we're likely to see increasing extortion, kidnapping and looting and business robbery risks. As I mentioned, the bottom line of these cartels is being affected. So they need to make up for those gains somewhere else. And easy wins for the cartel are robbing stores, extorting people, Uh, So this is going to increase risk for businesses and personnel in the area. That's particularly salient given that we've seen more than 60 reports of disappearances in recent weeks. Though, of course, the details are still quite hazy at the time. We don't know if these are necessarily individuals involved in the cartels themselves or kind of bystanders or other individuals being drawn in. Well, we've seen reports that bystanders have been kidnapped because they look slightly like other reported members of cartels. But in these cases... More often than not, the people reappear uh, later after a period of deprivation of liberty. Interesting. So um, clearly a lot of uncertainty and escalation in this localized area that's kind of, um, you know, exacerbating uh, bystander risks. OK, so we we have a good understanding of what's going on in Culiacán itself. Um, but something that I think is on the top of a lot of people's minds is the risk of spillover violence, given that um, factions of the Sinaloa cartel are now engaged in uh, turf wars and con- violent conflict. Um, what is the likelihood that this is going to move beyond the boundaries of Culiacán to other cities and regions, states of Mexico? Sure. So we're seeing violence across Sinaloa state, but in the neighboring states like Sonora, like in Durango, like in Nayarit, we are seeing reports of increasing violence in clashes, though we're not seeing confirmed reports that this is not due to the conflict between the two CDS factions. Mm. We are also seeing reports of increasing inter-cartel violence, so violence between the Sinaloa cartel and their main rivals, the Jalisco cartel and the Juarez cartel, for instance. So in Chihuahua, we've seen reports of clashes with Juarez cartel, and in places like Nayarit, there's instances where there could have been clashes between the CJNG and the Sinaloa cartel. Alex, there was an incident that we reported on the other week about um, an explosion at a concert in Zacatecas. Is this related at all to what's going on within the 
the CDS, the Sinaloa cartel. Sure. So the, re- the authorities in Zacatecas reported it as a gas explosion at a food store. But local reports suggest that it may have been otherwise. There are reports that this attack was carried out by the CJNG. There are also a t- a reports that this attack was carried out by the Sinaloa cartel. So um, the Sinaloa cartel and the CJNG sent out flyers and put out banners throughout Zacatecas and the municipalities that they had perpetrated the attack, threatening other, the other side. Mm-hmm. But there's a realistic possibility that this is disinformation and it was a gas explosion. So it's hard to say at this point, but there's a possibility. So it could even be plausible that the gas explosion was entirely separate from, you know, deliberate cartel violence, but um, armed actors are taking advantage of the violence and of the uncertainty to actually um, take responsibility for it to try to strike fear in the population. Yes, it's a change from the normal tactics, techniques and procedures of these cartels. Terrorism doesn't help the cartels. They need some degree of permissiveness from the population and from local security forces. A terrorist attack prompts a response from the security forces and prompts the population to oppose them. So as it's a departure from the the usual TTPs, I think it's unlikely that it was an attack, but there's a possibility. And Alex, I think that leads us to the next point in our discussion. So what is the federal government doing in response to the outbreak of violence in Sinaloa? So since the outbreak of violence, former president Andres Manuel López Obrador has downplayed the level of violence and current president Claudia Sheinbaum has also downplayed the level of violence. Since the escalation, around 2,000 security force personnel have been deployed by the military and the National Guard to Sinaloa and Culiacán to control the violence, but the role they're taking isn't a active role, it's a preventative role. They are prioritizing defending the population instead of going after cartel members They've only made roughly 50 arrests uh, in Culiacán itself, which is a relatively small number considering the scale of the violence that we're seeing. So, Alex, uh, we're recording this just a couple days after uh, Scheinbaum's inauguration. So we have a new president in Mexico City. Um, What is she likely to do as president? Concerning security, she's likely to continue AMLO, President Manuel López Obrador's previous strategy, and that is the hugs and not bullets strategy. So instead of going after the cartels and after the root cause of violence, instead looking at making social programs to disincentivize criminality. Throughout AMLO's six-year term, this has done very little to prevent violence and homicides and cartel activity. And given AMLO's popularity, she's likely to mimic his strategy for the, at least the first couple of years of her pres- six-year presidency. Um, And the signals we've received from her administration are that her five states of priority are Guanajuato, Baja California, Chihuahua, Guerrero and Jalisco. Sinaloa doesn't feature in her sort of top five ones to watch states. Um, As of Q2 2024, the city or the states with the highest rate of homicides are Colima, Morelos, Baja California, Chihuahua and Guanajuato. Sinaloa ranks 15th. But this recent outbreak of violence has almost certainly placed Sinaloa among those five. So she's continued this aversion to talking about Sinaloa in the media, continually downplaying it. So I think that will reflect a permissive aspect to the violence, Mm -hmm. allowing the cartels to fight each other and the military stepping in to protect civilians as and when. Mm -hmm. And, of course, there is a link to the ongoing um, constitutional reforms that, are, that have taken place in Mexico. Um, first, can you give us just a brief outline of what these reforms have been and how and why it relates to the security situation in the country? Sure. So the constitutional reform movement started in February when former President AMLO suggested a slate of 20 constitutional reforms that he wanted to push through before the end of his presidency. In the June second election, uh, Morena, his party, won a massive supermajority in the Chamber of Deputies and a very near supermajority in the Senate. A supermajority is needed to pass these reforms without any consultation from the opposition. And the new Congress with the supermajority took office on the 1st of September and Shane Baum took office on the 1st of October. So during that month of September, AMLO has really pushed these constitutional reforms through and he's primarily forced three through. Firstly, it's a judicial reform. Secondly, it's a reform to the National Guard. Uh, 
and thirdly, a reform to Afro-Indigenous rights. The most controversial reforms are those of the judicial reform and the uh, National Guard. The judicial reforms seek to create elections for all magistrates, judges and judicial personnel and the National Guard reform seeks to move it from the Security Department to the Ministry of Defence, the SEDENA. Okay, so what is the implication, Alex, of you know, the move for, of the National Guard to fall under the MOD, the SEDENA? So the key risks I would highlight are human rights and the lethality of the police forces. Moving the National Guard, a primarily civilian body, under the SEDENA leadership allows the members of the National Guard to have military immunity when it comes to prosecution. And this will increase human rights risks. But also if we look at other peer countries in Latin America, like Brazil, for instance, mm. their military police is also under the Ministry of Defense in Brazil. And the police lethality and brutality is a real risk and a growing risk in Brazil. So we're likely to see increases in police lethality and use of force in Me Mexico also. This certainly dovetails with other kind of long-standing trends in Mexico, whereby um, the administration of public infrastructure has also been uh, shifted under the, the military as well, including the National Guard. So the military control an airport, they control airlines, they control rail infrastructure. So moving the National Guard into the, under the same umbrella increases these militarization risks and the militarization of the infrastructure as well. Yeah, and in the long term, of course, um, that militarization of control over key infrastructure could potentially pose um, risks to business operations and logistics. So, Alex, how do these judicial reforms, as you mentioned, uh, relate to the interests of organized crime groups? One of the key concerns with the judicial reforms is the influence of organized crime on these elections. So the most recent general elections that took place on 2nd of June were some of the most bloody we've seen in Mexican, if not Latin American history. Uh, tens of political candidates, pre-candidates, mayors have been assassinated because they weren't given the OK by local organised crime groups. When we see the judicial elections, there's a realistic possibility that organised crime groups push for permissive judges, judges that they have on their payroll to facilitate their operations and facilitate their violence continuing. So as well as the politicization aspect of the judicial reforms, there's also a risk of organized crime infiltration into the judiciary, like we've seen in Ecuador. So as we look to June 2025, when um, the round of elections for Supreme Court justices in Mexico is slated to take place, um, as well as other uh, judicial posts across the country, we could see a resurgence of this pre-election violence, this electoral uh, violence that's targeting candidates. I think it's a realistic possibility, yes. So, Alex, we have a roiling security crisis in Sinaloa and that will potentially expand to other states. Um, what are the triggers, warnings and indicators that you are watching for that will signal to our audience um, that we're seeing kind of a major escalation in the security situation? Yeah, there are two ways to look at this, the security side and the political side. So on the security side, what I'm looking for is open clashes between cartels, open clashes between cartels and security forces during daylight hours. <clears throat> I'm also looking at clashes in neighboring states and the CJNG and other rival factions or rival cartels taking responsibility and claiming attacks on the Sinaloa cartel. What I'm also looking for from a political aspect is continued downplaying of the current violence by Shane Baum during her speeches and continued attempts to militarize the security forces and putting a focus on other states like Guanajuato instead of Sinaloa. And I guess there's a realistic possibility that if this internal factionalism and violence within the CDS, the cartel of Sinaloa, continues, that rival cartels, specifically the CGNG, could also seek to exploit it, which could ultimately result in a greater long-term risk of violence that could potentially be very difficult for the federal government and the president to ignore. I think it's likely it's something we need to look at going forward. Well, thank you very much to our audience for joining me and to Alex for his insightful analysis. Keep an eye on our feeds for details about our further reporting. We have just issued a situation update brief on cartel violence in Mexico, so be sure to keep an eye out for that. And we look forward to seeing you next time.